I hope that what I preach on this morning will take and, and stir a little bit. Uh, it's going to be probably a repeat of something that you've heard as he taught the book of John, because we'll be in the book of John, but I hope it will be a blessing to you. Years ago, there was a song, turn to John 13, if you will, but years ago there was a song that was sung by Jackie D. Sherman in our Sharon in 1965. And that song back in 65 uh, that was sung in which the words were sung, and these are the words that were sung, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. The problem is this. It may sound good, but the problem is the world has no concept of what real love is about. If you and I are going to be people who show love, we must know the person of love, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. He is love. How many say amen to that? God is love. Jesus is love. Secondly, I would say to you, if we're going to show love, we must have a spirit about us called a servant. And there's another song, and I'll try to use it at the end of the message as well, but it's called, and you all know this one, if you've been around church for any time, in kids' church, whatever, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So this morning I want to preach on this subject, if you will, how we can be a better servant and let our light shine in a dark world. There is a need for lights to shine today. There is a need for us to be a light in this dark world. And I would say to you that Jesus said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How many say amen to that? But we need to let our light shine a little bit brighter because we're living in a different world today than when I was young. Now, y'all can say amen to that, because, you know, I know I'm old, but that's okay. <laughs> but I'll share this with you. When I, when I was growing up on the farm uh, up in Colorado, it would be pitch black out in the fields. Our closest neighbor when I was growing up was half a mile away. And we would take, and, and I'd be out there after school, I'd be in the tractor, we'd be plowing or disking in the field or whatever, and as it was completely pitch black, of course, you might see stars up in the sky and all that, but it's still dark. And as I was looking, thinking back to those days, I can see off in the distance a light of the farmhouse. You could be half a mile away, you could be a mile away, but yet you could still see the light of the farmhouse while you're out there in the dark. I would say this to you, that light brought comfort. That light to me as growing up as a teenager on the farm, that light brought not only comfort, it brought security. Knowing that that light was on and knowing that mom and dad were there. Security. That light brought me compassion because I knew that mom and dad loved me and cared for me. All getting just this morning, just imagine for a moment that you are out in that field with me on that John Deere tractor, by the way. And imagine, if you will, that we're plowing in that field and we're looking off in the distance and we see that light. It gives warmth. Folks, we're living in a dark world. This world is not the same today as when I was growing up. This world is not the same today as when you were growing up. I remember years ago when I first started uh, preaching and pastoring in the 80s, I remember of how you didn't have to worry about hearing about transgenderism. You didn't have to worry about hearing about the homosexuality. You didn't have to worry about all the stuff that's going on today. And yet as time has gone by, we know that the world is getting worse. But not only is the world getting worse, America is getting worse. And I thank God for July 4th, 1776. Somebody say amen to that. I thank God for the freedom that we have in America. But in 247 years, America still stands. And thank God for that. And we ought to praise God for America. But America needs a turn. 
And America's not going to turn, listen carefully, America's not going to turn because of what happens in politics. America's not going to turn because of what's going on in TV. America's not going to turn because of all these things. America will turn when God's people, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, get right with God. And again, become a light in the dark world. So I want to share this message with us this morning that God's laid on my heart about how we can let our light shine a little bit brighter. Let's stand, if you're able to, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Underline that in your Bible. That is so powerful of a verse. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, uh, disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, verse 8, Thou shalt never wash my feet. By the way, y'all may call it wash, I call it wash. Amen? Anyway, <laughs> thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Verse 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. Can you imagine the thought that came through the heart of the disciples? For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, this is not an ordinance, but he's given us an example. There's only two ordinances to the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But this is an example that is needed for people to understand. For I've given you an example, you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is uh, sent greater than he that sent him. Verse 17, if you know these things, Happy are ye, if ye, say it with me, do them. How can we be happy Christians? How can we let our light shine in a dark world? It's by being a servant the way God wants. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to open the Word of God and just share what you've laid on my heart. You know everyone in this room today. And you know every thought that we have. Lord, I pray you'd build a hedge around this place this morning. I pray that because of your power and blood that you'd bind up anything that would hinder the work of God. Holy Spirit, that you'd fill me and anoint my lips to say what you once said and have your will done in this place and we praise you that you are the Lord in Jesus name amen please be seated if you will before the peace, uh, feast of Passover the meal to remember the Passover time in the book of Exodus we find that Christ and the disciples are up in the upper room and as they're in that upper room, they're going to have a meal. And then, of course, even as Brother McClure brought out this morning, after the meal, 
Judas Iscariot left, and then the Lord's Supper was given to the local church. The thing that I think is interesting that the Lord began to speak to my heart about as I was studying and reading is that Jesus knew what was ahead. Of course, he knows because he's God. But I want you to put yourself, if you will, in his shoes or sandals just for a moment. He knew what was ahead. He knew that, as was shared in Sunday school, that in a few short hours... He would be betrayed. He knew that after he'd be betrayed, he would be arrested. He would be spit upon. He would be mocked. He would have the beard plucked out. He would be on trial before before Pilate and before the high priest and so on. He would have the people say, we have no king but Caesar. The same ones who just a few days earlier had, had said, hail, king of King of kings, glory to the Lord. Yet they were still the ones who came along, many of them, and said, we don't have any king but Caesar. We don't want him. In fact, we don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. We want the one who was a thief and a robber and a murderer. We'd rather have him than have Jesus Christ. And that's the way the world is still today. But yeah, as I think about that situation and, and Jesus knowing what was on the horizon a horizon. As he goes there and he's sharing in John chapter number 13, the passage that we're going to be looking at, he was thinking not of himself. He was thinking not of the pain he was going to go through. He was thinking not of the situation of his life. He was thinking of others. And I thought about that and it's like, you know, I said to the Lord, wow. In spite of everything that you have come through, and in spite of everything you're going to go through, while you're in the upper room, you are thinking of somebody else. And I'd say to you this morning, one of the reasons we are not the servant we ought to be is because we're not thinking of others, we're too busy thinking of ourselves. And Jesus took and he was thinking of others. The supper is over and Jesus gets up before Judas left. And he takes off his coat and he fills a wash basin. Got to pretend it's bigger. But he fills the wash basin with water and takes a towel and girds himself with the towel. And he does something that the disciples had no idea what was going on. He became a servant to them. You see, it was a normal thing, customary thing back in those days that when you went into a house, there would be a humble servant that would take, and as you walked in, you would have the servant take and and wash your feet to get the dust off. You ever been out in the dirt and you're, you're, well, if you wore sandals or maybe you didn't wear sandals. When I was growing up on the farm, I wore shoes because I didn't want to step step on the stickers, Amen. But you know how it is when when you're walking along and the dust gets on your feet and things of that nature. And so when you walked into somebody's home, the servant would be there with the wash basin and with the towel, and he'd wash your feet. They'd gone through the entire meal, Brother McClure. The entire meal. Not one of the disciples said, I'm going to go wash somebody's feet. They knew that the servant was not there. It was just the good old boys and Jesus. And not one of them thought, I need to wash Jesus' feet. He's done so much for me. He loves me so much. But not one of them, Peter, James, John, none of them, Matthew, all of them, not one of them got up, went over, took a towel and said, can I wash your feet? Not one. Preacher, why is that? Well, very simply this, they were more concerned about arguing among themselves about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. (laughs) And that's true. You go ahead and read those chapters right around that. They were all upset. They were thinking about themselves. They were thinking about, well, who's going to get to sit by Jesus at the table? Who's the one that's going to get to sit by Jesus in the kingdom? 
Who's, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? They were all concerned about themselves. Not about the Lord. Not about the people of the world. Not about their neighbor. They had what's called eye problem. How many know what I'm talking about? Eye problem. And so I began to think about that, and I began to think, and the Lord gave me some thoughts about how to become a servant and why they were not the example that they should be of a servant. We see Jesus in this passage. He takes his coat off. He picks up the towel. He picks up the wash basin. He begins to wash the feet of the disciples, and he gets to Peter, and Peter said, are you going to wash my feet? No, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Well, Lord, just give me an entire bath, head to toe. And aren't you glad Jesus said, once you're washed, you don't need to be washed except your feet. You say, what does that mean? That's eternal life. Once you have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can't lose your salvation. Somebody say amen to that. It's there and it's permanent. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. I'm thankful for that because if, I could, if you could take and, or I could take and get saved and lose our salvation, we'd be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. And the Bible teaches us Jesus only came one time, died on the cross one time, was buried one time, rose again one time. Our salvation is secure in Jesus Christ, John 10, 28 and 29. Aren't you glad we're secure in him? Amen. But Jesus said to the disciples, No, Peter, once you're saved... Once you're washed, you're washed forever. But he said, not everybody here is clean. That tells me something. That tells me this. Even though Judas Iscariot, he was an unsaved man. He was a religious man. He'd been around Christ for, for several years, but he never trusted Christ as a Savior. But isn't it amazing, and the Lord shared with me this with me as well, isn't it amazing that while they're in the upper room, before Judas left, Jesus washed the feet. Of all the disciples, including Judas, which is an example to you and I, that we should be concerned not just about saved people, but lost people. And not just about people who are lost without Christ, but about saved people. Everybody needs somebody sometimes. So what is the reason why they did not want to be a servant? Well, let me give you one other thing, and they'll jump into that. Jesus said, if you want to be happy, not just know what you're supposed to do, but do it. But do it. And then you'll be blessed, and you'll be a light shining among men. So, disciples, what is the problem? Why are you not being a servant? Let me give these four reasons to you this morning. If you're taking some notes, I hope it will be a blessing to you. Because as I mentioned, we live in a very dark world. We have the word of God. We have the example of what Jesus did for us. But why is the church, and I'm going to narrow it down, even Baptist, godly Baptist churches, but that's narrowed down. Why are we not making an impact on the world, but the darkness of the world is making more of an impact on us? First of all, I'd say this to you. The reason why our light is dimming out, I'm not saying going out. but dimming a little bit. And the reason why the disciples, their light of being a servant was dimming out that's going on today is, number one, we don't have love for people anymore. You know, wait a second, preacher. What are you trying to say? Well, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, God has given two commandments. The one... Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus would say in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if ye have love one for another. But the disciples remember the passage. They're arguing with each other who's going to be the greatest. 
Sometimes we all go through this situation of where we want others to love us and do for us, and we're not concerned about loving and doing to them. Well, I'm reminded of the Church of Corinth. The Church of Corinth was a very carnal church. The major problem in the Church of Corinth was selfishness. I'm better than you are. You don't have the same gift as I do. Or the idea is, I deserve people to do this for me. How many know what I'm talking about? I deserve for you to do this to me. It's my rights. We live in a world today that says it's my rights. By the way, we don't have any rights at all. The only right that we have is the right to die and end up in hell. Everything else is a gift. And all glory ought to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 16, Jesus says this, if you will, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is uh, sent greater than he that sent him. A servant. It means a slave. It means someone who is bought and paid for and is owned by the master. You and I, when we're saved, we are bought with a price. The Bible says, therefore, we ought to uh, glorify God in our body and soul, which are the Lord's. We're not our own. In Luke 17, verse number 10, the scripture says, So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded, you say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. I think sometimes, and my dad used to tell me this whenever I was growing up, Son, you're getting too big for your britches. Anybody ever hear that before? You knew my dad, didn't you? But you know, whenever dad said, you're getting too big for your britches, he was going to take care and make sure the britches fit again. But I'm telling you this, and there's too many things in America where people are too, quote unquote, too big for their britches, and they just think the, whole, the world owes them a living, things of that nature. We got to get back to the point where we realize it's the gift of God that we have. So everybody take a deep, deep breath right, right now. No, you can let it out, too, if you want to. But if you don't, we're going to be over there doing CPR. But that, that breath that you have was a gift of God. Everything that we have is a gift of God. But so many times we think we deserve it. And we don't even say thank you to the Lord for it. So I'm saying to you, number one, the disciples were in the condition they were because they lost love for humanity and for Christ. Number two, their light began to dim and they stopped being a servant because they began to compare themselves with each other. You ever done that? When I was growing up, I had two older brothers. I still do. One's in heaven. My brother took, they were five or four and five years older than me, which would mean that they're still, except for my brother in heaven, he, my oldest brother is still five years older than me. When I was growing up, I, I grew up on the farm, as I mentioned, and we went to the same school. I went to the same school all 12 years of my life. And so the teachers knew my brothers. And when I'd get up to that grade, they'd say, are you going to be like your brother, Ron? Are you going to be like your brother, Don? You know, Ron played uh, cymbals and things of that nature. Don played the trumpet. I said, I'm going for the trumpet. But anyway, as we got older and older, the teachers would say, are you going to be like this? Are you going to be like this? And let me say, you and I have many times in our life where, we, where people have the idea, are you like them? Are you going to do what they do? Are you going to act like they do? And the problem with that is this. We can learn by example. Somebody say amen to that. Paul said that he was an example. But the principle is we got to realize when God made you, he threw away the mold. Nobody's just like you. 
Look at your neighbor and say, nobody's just, don't say that. <laughs> no, there's nobody just like you. God made you. God loves you. God lo cares for you. But the reason I think that going on in society today, we stop being the servant we should be is we're comparing ourselves to somebody else. I can't do it like they did. I'm not as good at doing that like they are. Somebody can always do it better than us. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. Said that before? Well, you're not like them. Well, understand the best imitation is still an imitation. God didn't make you an imitation. He made you unique. And no matter what your talents are, no matter what your abilities are, God can, hear me clearly, still use you. And when we begin to compare ourselves with one another, Paul said, they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 12. So I would say that one of the reasons they stopped being a servant and being the light that sh they should be is they were comparing themselves and saying, well, maybe that person ought to do it. Maybe that person ought to be the one who washes the feet. Maybe it's old Peter. He's the one. He's always the spokesman. He's always the one that brags all the time. Peter, you get up and you go wash the feet. All these other thoughts came in people's minds in today's society. We're saying, God can't use me. Let me ask you this. Can God use you today? I'm sorry. Can God use you today? Yes. Yes. And when you and I begin to compare ourselves with someone else, your light begins to dim. And when your light begins to dim, you stop being the servant. And when you stop being the servant, you stop living a life that brings glory to God. Let me hurry, if you will. Number three. Sometimes people come along and say, well, God can't use me anymore because I've just messed up too bad. Every one of us could raise our hand today and say, I've messed up. The Lord told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house. When he got to the potter's house, he said, Jeremiah, why don't you take a look in there? He tells us the potter was making a vessel, but the vessel was cracked. And the potter put it back on the potter's wheel, began to reform it. Every one of us, don't take offense to what I'm about to say, but every one of us are crackpots. <laughs> but please understand what I'm saying. Every one of us have flaws. And I'm glad God doesn't throw us away. You can go to the Bible. You read about Samson. A womanizer. But God still used him. He got right with God, by the way. You can read about David, who was an adulterer. But aren't you glad for the life of David and his, his uh, kingship and things of that nature? He had a lot of problems but God could still use him. You think about Peter who would deny the Lord, but even after denying the Lord those three times at the fire, he got right with God, and God did use him again. Day of Pentecost and other times. You think about James and John who came along as disciples of the Lord, and they were called the sons of Bonajeris. They had a terrible temper, but yet God used John to write John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, where he talks so much about love. You think about Paul, the apostle, who came along and Paul said, I am the chiefest of sinners. I took and I, I gave my voice against the Christians that they would be killed. But he got saved. That didn't make him perfect. He still had a squabble with Barnabas there. But the principle of the matter is, God still used them. He took those who were broken, and he, re he mended them up, and he used them. And you say, I've done so many things in my life. I'm glad 1 John 1, 9 is still in the Word of God. Hallelujah. If we confess our sins and, and, and seek His forgiveness, He's willing to forgive 
and cleanse us from all righteous, unrighteousness. Amen. Aren't you glad for Psalms 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Somebody ought to say glory to God for that. I'm glad Jesus loves me and he forgives me and he can make me anew and he can use me for his glory. Amen. If, Amen. if I'm willing to humble myself and be a servant and wash the feet of others no matter who they are because somebody needs somebody who cares about them. Let me give you one more thought. People are not used today because they don't want to be used. Have you ever planted a garden? You ought to try it sometime. I can kill plants just like that. <laughs> if you don't believe me, ask my wife. Now, I've got a packet of seeds here. Aren't they pretty? How about that one? You like those? How about this one? Wouldn't you love to see these flowers? How many say, I love to see these flowers? Take a look. There they are. <laughs> the seeds and the flower in, the, in this packet may look pretty, but you can't pick them out of the ground and give them to your wife. You, you can't take these seeds that are in the packet and have them surround your house pretty and people go by your house and say, those are so pretty. You can't take those flowers and give them to your neighbor. You can't give them to the people down at the hospital. By the way, I ought to care for people in the nursing homes and hospitals and everywhere. But these are pretty seeds, aren't they, brother? Oh, yeah. Boy, they're pretty. But they're not doing a bit of good because they're still in the packet. I've had these packet of seeds for about five years. <laughs> Anytime I want to, it's, say the anniversary, I take a packet to my wife, say, here you go, hon. <laughs> no, I don't do that. But anyway. God wants to work in us and through us. But sometimes we say, God, I don't want to. And because we say, God, I don't want to, we're not able to be a blessing to someone else. And God is not glorified. Because the people don't see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. I don't want to be that way. I don't want my days to come to an end. And when people walk by my casket, they say, well, he looked good in that packet. I want my life to be such when people think of Tim Lyle, they say he was a servant. He cared for somebody else. He made a difference in me. And for the Lord to say to me, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're not somebody else. But you are you. You don't have the ability somebody else has. But you're you. You'll meet people I'll never meet. You'll meet people that Brother McClure will never meet. Or your pastor. 
You'll meet people that your neighbor will never meet or the person sitting next to you. But you can make a difference in someone else. It's a dark, dark, dark world. But I want to be like mom and dad's farmhouse. Let the light shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No! I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. How am I going to do that? A relationship with Jesus. As my Savior, as my Lord, as my friend, my love for him. I appreciate what Brother McClure said this morning, how he said, I love the word of God. Well, we need to love his word more. Fellowship. Fellowship with one another. Care for someone else. That God, just wake up in the morning and say, God, use me today to care for somebody else. Put somebody on my mind today and use me to be a help to somebody else. And you're saying, well, I need the help. Well, hang on. Jesus said, happy are ye if you do them. The more you, you say, well, I'm going through the problems. Yeah, but we all know this. If you're going through problems, go help somebody else. It will change the way you feel. Just be a servant. Say, God, here am I. Use me. It may not change America, but it can change your life and somebody else. To say yes to the Lord. Let's bow our heads, please. Lord, we praise you. And we honor you today.